That was um, from the Vineyard album called Vintage Vineyard Music, uh, Glory, um, and uh, it's from 1996. That song is called Holy is the Lord, and um, yeah, I really like that. And as you can notice, like, it's a simple repetitive song. I mean, the reason why it was so repetitive is because that's what charismatic worship is. It's contemplative worship the objective is to get focused on the lord while your eyes are shut the objective is not to analyze paragraphs and paragraphs of rational rational discourse about soteriology right it's to get out of that rationalistic state that is so common in calvinistic deism cynicism skepticism rationalism it's to get out of that spock like state and to get into the mystic state the mystic state of union with the Holy Spirit. And uh, through your eyes shut and just focusing on the Lord. That's why they make it so repetitive sounding. Um, so that you can get into a contemplative mindset and actually end up feeling the presence of God. Um, <clears throat> so that's one of the things that the vineyard had perfected under John Wimber, who was a musician and and uh, and he became something of a record producer uh, of those, you know, of those those uh, worship albums that they made before he died in 1997. So a lot of that stuff's really, without without any exaggeration, anointed. Those Vineyard albums from the 80s and 90s, uh, some of those songs are not only sound good, I mean, from like a rock point of view, but just they're anointed with the Holy Spirit. Um, so what is the Holy Spirit of the Vineyard? You ever thought that? Okay, so they're claiming to have open visions and hearing the voice of God. And John MacArthur, 
is claiming that it's the devil because after all the miraculous gifts have ceased so therefore anything that looks like it's miracles is just the devil of course he's blaspheming the holy ghost when he does that i believe you can't look at manifestations of the holy spirit in a church call it the devil and not up, not end up totally hardening your heart in a, into a state of unbelief to where you don't even experience spiritual experiences from god and he says blasphemy jesus says blasphemy against the holy spirit is the worst sin and it cannot be forgiven why because it leads to apostasy and unbelief and hardening of heart which only the holy spirit can give which is faith only the holy spirit can give faith true faith in the existence of god in the truth of the gospel and so when you blaspheme the holy spirit you cause the holy spirit to fly away from you and you do not have real faith even though from all outward appearances you might have a posh facility you might have hundred dollar bibles you might have hundred maybe even thousand dollar suits and nice church buildings and nice schools but you don't have real faith and so the fact of the matter is when you die you're going to go to hell jesus looked at the pharisees squarely and he said how shall ye escape damnation what is the holy spirit of the vineyard um well well John Wimber was coming out of an evangelical friends environment, kind of like Richard J. Foster. Um, so, and he also spent time in Calvary Chapel. So we could rightly say that uh, John Wimber's background should give us an idea of what kind of a Holy Spirit he believes in, right? He believed in uh, the Holy Spirit of the evangelical friends, which is essentially a blending of Quakerism with Wesleyan holiness christianity that came from the holiness movement so the evangelical friends essentially blended quakerism with methodism was what they did so the holy spirit that they believe in is more or less the holy spirit john wesley believed in and i think it would be right to say that a lot of the early methodists in the 1800s had people migrating over from the quakers as well so it seems that the Methodism's Holy Spirit has always been sort of a blending of the Quakers with the Methodists. And so would be right to say that if, if, if um, since John Wimber came out of the Evangelical Friends, he was representing the same Holy Spirit as the Methodists. Same Holy Spirit. And then uh, the fact that he stayed in Calvary Chapel for a while before he started the vineyard goes to show that he, he represented also the Holy Spirit of the vineyard. I mean, I'm sorry, of, of, of the Jesus movement, of Chuck Smith. So that would be Foursquare Church, basically, which is Pentecostal, again, going back to Wesleyanism, going back to Methodism. So Chuck Smith came out of the Foursquare Church, which is a Pentecostal denomination, which was Wesleyan. So it's, it's just all Wesleyan. The whole thing. Well, Vineyard was Wesleyan. Now, along the way, Chuck Smith sort of crystallized Calvary Chapel into a eternal security denomination. So that's that's something that he did, right? Um, and and so that was not a distinctive of the Foursquare. The Foursquare was Wesleyan and would have believed in it, a conditional security that you could lose your salvation if you lost your faith. Chuck Smith changed that um, and created a sort of an eternal security setup. And so um, with that coming in, uh, John Wimber kind of adopted that more or less, but you're kind of left with this sort of this ambiguous um, view on that for quite a while because the focus of the vineyard was not soteriology, it was pneumatology. The vineyard, John Wimber had believed that the majority of the churches had focused so much on the doctrine of salvation and, and, and done it so rationalistically, thinking about people like John MacArthur and Billy Graham, 
and, and not enough attention had been given to pneumatology, to the study of the Holy Spirit, to the experience of the Holy Spirit. And so the vineyards focused, not even the Pentecostal churches, in John Wimber's opinion, had done enough. Like He, he looked at assemblies of God, and he, and he just felt like they hadn't gone far enough. And um, so the, the purpose of the vineyard was really to maximize the Christian's experience of the Holy Spirit. That, that was the, the, mi the mission of the vineyard, to, uh, at least in Wimber's day, uh, was to get people to really feel the Holy Spirit during worship and then turn out with prophetic words, healings, and miracles. All the experiential aspects that had been neglected in all the other bodies, even in the Pentecostal churches, he wanted to he wanted to focus on that. So, the issue of eternal security sort of remained sort of an ambiguous sort of a thing in the vineyard for a while, until Wayne Grudem came along. Now, Wayne Grudem was a vineyard pastor when he wrote Systematic Theology in 1995, which he takes an eternal security position there. Of course, when he published that book, he left the vineyard because a couple of years afterwards, John Wimber died and he went into academia. But it kind of gives you a feeling that if Wayne Grudem, Grudem was risen up to articulate uh, eternal security out of the vineyard, and, and also Jack Deere well, kind of gives you an idea that eternal security was always there in the vineyard, with Jack Deere because he was coming out of a Baptist seminary. Um, and so it was kind of like, yeah, but it seems that John Wimber was like, uh, I, I, I'm neither Calvinist nor Arminian. It doesn't matter because the Holy Spirit's on both sides of the fence. Um, so John Wimber was about like, let's keep that ambiguous. Um, and let's just focus on getting people healed and baptized in the Holy Spirit. So that whole eternal security issue was never really hammered out by John Wimber. And, um, and, and so was the, was the vineyard during John Wimber's times Calvinist charismatic or Wesleyan charismatic? The answer to that is yes. In other words, both. Um, it was, it was a place, it was a place that was welcome for anybody that wanted to experience the Holy Spirit. Anybody who was Calvinist who wanted to experience the Holy Spirit. Anybody who was Wesleyan who wanted to experience the Holy Spirit. Anybody who was from mainline liberalism and wanted to come into an evangelical charismatic setting could come in. Anybody was welcome as long as they wanted to believe in the Holy Spirit and experience the Holy Spirit. So John Wimber was very... Uh, much like John Wen, uh, John Wesley in this sense that he was he had the, he had what John Wesley called the Catholic spirit. He was very he was very ecumenical in, it, in that sense. Um, but um, what did John Wimber really believe? I think that it kind of goes to show that he leaned in the eternal security direction um, because he came from Calvary Chapel before he started the Vineyard, and they had already crystallized eternal security. Um, he had Wayne Grudem and he had Jack Deere. Both of the, those guys were Calvinistic. Um, and, and so, but it, it's not to say that this was uniform across the board. You had John Paul Jackson, who was a Kansas City prophet guy. And he, I believe he came from Assemblies of God, which is Wesleyan. So there was always a mixture, at least during John Wimber's lifetime, it was always a mixture of Calvinists and Arminians in the, in the vineyard. It was really after John Wimber's death in 1997 that the vineyard seems to have become more and more Calvinist charismatic. And so today, if you're a person that's really committed to the doctrine of once saved, always saved, okay, if you're really committed to that, there's no way that you're ever going to move away from that. The vineyard is most likely, and you become charismatic, and end up speaking in tongues and having visions, the vineyard is most likely the denomination that would accept a person with a Calvinistic charismatic leaning. Um, uh, but I don't, I don't think you have to be, even today, a person who believes in eternal security to be part of that denomination, if you were a minister. Um, 
But I'm going to say, I think that the Calvinist Charismatics won out in that denomination, in the persons of, you know, through, through basically Wayne Grudem's systematic theology and all of Jack Deere's books, you know, those appeal to people who are coming from a Baptist background and want, the, want to experience the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Another thing that the Vineyard uh, did that was different from Assemblies of God and Church of God was that the Vineyard did not teach the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Uh, they, teach, they taught that, you know, anybody who believes in Jesus has the Holy Spirit indwelling them, and so therefore that's all you need of the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, and so then, you know, you ended up getting this people feeling the presence of God during worship, and that was not called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And that caused confusion, the confusion today that we have over this, over this street level expression, feel the presence of God in worship. It used to be called the baptism in the Holy Spirit in Assemblies of God and Church of God. That's what it used to be called and still is called that, but... Have people changed the understanding so much to the point that they don't even know that feel the presence of God means that? Right? That's what it means. It's where you have the Holy Spirit come upon you and clothe you. But the vineyard, you know, I, I would have to say, it would be right to say, the vineyard was mainly made up of Baptists and Presbyterians who wanted to be charismatic. And then afterwards they experienced stuff by faith and they were like, well, where am I supposed to go? The vineyard. That's where you go. You go to the vineyard. If you still want to stay in that belief of once saved, always saved, then the vineyard's the place for a Calvinist charismatic once saved, always saved person to go. That's the where you go. It's it's the vineyard. Vineyard USA. Um, <clears throat> if you completely reject once saved, always saved, then Assemblies of God and Church of God is the place for you to go. If you if you have charismatic gifts. So I would always lean towards, at least doctrinally, toward Assemblies of God and Church of God. I always lean towards them. Although, that's one thing, spiritual declension and spiritual revival is quite another. You know, it's one thing to sit here on an armchair and talk about speculative theology in some sort of an abstract sense up in the sky. It's quite another to go into these churches and see so many people have lost their faith and are just acting very bad. And there's just porn epidemic all over these ministries. So, I mean, <clears throat> proceed with caution in all cases. But um, I want to talk about the Holy Spirit now. And what kind of Holy Spirit was in the vineyard uh, during the time of Wimber and afterwards and today? And, you know, where is it going? Well, it's never been the devil. It's never been the devil. There's absolutely no support for that. Um, so when when these uh, people like uh, John MacArthur, you know, used to criticize the Vineyard, it's just without warrant. You know, they're they're, they're coming from a Baptist theolog theological background, essentially. Um, and then when they say they feel the presence of God, that's what they mean. They're, they 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 believe they believe in the the surprising work of the Spirit of God that Jonathan Edwards was describing. That's that's what they're talking about. That's the theology they're talking about. Um, so they're talking about great awakening type presence of God. Um, they're, so they're not they're not talking about new age doctrine. They're not talking about doctrines of devils. They're not talking about weird cult like. We're talking about a guy John Wimber who used to have you know conferences at Southern Baptist churches all over the country. We're not talking about a guy with weird new age doctrines. We're talking about a guy who believed in the Holy Spirit of Jonathan Edwards, who believed in the Holy Spirit of John Wesley, and believed that they were all the same. He had come to the conclusion that theological and doctrinal perfectionism <clears throat> was not how you identify the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit's a whole lot more open-minded about theological differences than men are. 
Um, but with that being said, that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is going to verify outright heresy. I personally believe that this Messianic Judaism movement that's being led by different charismatic leaders is not from the Lord. And there's evidence in Colossians, there's evidence in Galatians, that those guys had charismatic experiences to lead them into Messianic Judaism. I don't agree with that being from the Holy Spirit. And I think the Apostle Paul indicated that those charismatic experiences were from the devil. That when he spoke of an angel masquerading as an angel of light, a Satan masquerading as an angel of light, that he was talking about Messianic Jewish charismatics who were leading them away from the gospel. So if we're talking about the gospel as essentially existing within Calvinism and Arminianism, then we can, we can we safely say that it's the Holy Spirit. Um, and if we also say that the Holy Spirit moved in different Catholic movements before the Reformation under Luther, then we can also say safely that that's the Holy Spirit. It's when we start moving outside of Christianity that we have to question spiritual experiences and be like, yeah, that's probably the devil. If it's non-Christian... Right? If, we're, if it's a Hindu or a Muslim or a Buddhist spiritual experience, it's, the, it's demonic. You know, and Deuteronomy 18 talks about that. It talks about people going after other gods. But pre-Reformation Christianity was Catholic, although it had a lot of false beliefs in it. That's what Christianity was before the Reformation. It was the Catholic Church. That's the Holy Trinity. That's not another God. It's not other gods. It's not Hinduism or Buddhism or Islam. So it's safe to say the Holy Spirit was still manifesting in certain people's lives before the Reformation in the Catholic Church. <clears throat> safe to say that. Especially since Institutes of the Christian Religion by John Calvin occasionally borrowed quotations from Catholic, um, Catholic writers from, from the early church. So it's safe to say the Holy Spirit was still moving in the Roman Catholic Church before Luther. After Luther, immediately after Luther, there were very Catholic saint type experiences that happened among reformers in Scotland. Especially the reformers that surrounded themselves around John Knox and what came to be called the Covenanters. These reformers were Presbyterian in their theological views, but they were charismatic in their personal and spiritual experiences. So they were really, they were, they were Presbyterian charismatics. The closest thing to that today is the vineyard. And, um, and as time went on, Jack Deere, who was essentially the the one vineyard theologian that other than Wayne Grudem that helped to crystallize especially the experiential parts of charismatic experience in the vineyard in his book why, uh, surprised by the voice of god and why i am still surprised by the voice of god which just came out a couple of years ago and i've just started going through it and i just finished chapter 2 where he has a section on the miracles of the scottish covenanters and I would have to say that when we do theology, it's scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. What we call the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Scripture, we know what that is. That's the Bible. That comes first. Tradition comes second. That's the lives of, of, of missionaries and theologians that were godly from the past that can help us to interpret scripture. Reason is the process of using our head and our intellect to figure out what the scripture is saying about something. And then experience, our own personal spiritual experience. Does it line up with what is found in the scriptures? And if not, how can we use reason and tradition to help us bridge those gaps? And so when we look at this book, Why I Am Still Surprised by the Voice of God by Jack Deere, we're not just seeing a book written by a guy. We're seeing a guy who had direct contact with John Wimber throughout the founding stages of 
the vineyard. We're also seeing a guy who was taught by John Wimber how to operate in prophetic and healing ministries and deliverance ministries. And so he knows all the miraculous elements of the Holy Spirit, has personally experienced them, and has opera operated as an Old Testament prophecy professor for 12 years at Dallas Theological Seminary before he went into the vineyard. So he's the perfectly qualified person to teach people about the Holy Spirit. Um, and uh, so he has a chapter on the miracles of the Scottish Covenanters. And it seems to me that he he had kind of nailed nailed it down that this was the best uh, tradition element that people could theologically resort to as a historical point of reference for the Holy Spirit we're all talking about when we talk about the Holy Spirit of the vineyard. Um, in, in chapter 2 of Why I Am Still Surprised by the Voice of God, he first off talks about, or I'm sorry, it's chapter 3. First off, he's talking about John Paul Jackson who's dead now, but um, he was a dream-based prophesier. You know, in other words, he would get have dreams, and then, or he would have closed visions while he was praying with his eyes closed about people in church, and then he would share what he saw in his dream or his vision, and then he would give the gist or the meaning of that to that person. And it would, and in words of knowledge, there would be the reading of the secrets of their hearts would come out out of that. Now he he talks about that for a little bit, and then he goes on to talk about a handful of dream and vision seers among the Covenanters, the Scottish reformers of Scotland. He talks about several people, and I'm going to read some selections out of that because. If, if John MacArthur is so used, and people like him are so used to saying that charismatics are just feeling the devil, and they're just seeing stuff from the devil, and they see lights, oh, that's just an angel of light masquerading as an angel of light, a demon. You know, they just want to demonize everything and blaspheme every, every single Holy Spirit experience that comes from the Lord. And, and chapter 3 of Why I Am Still Surprised by the Voice of God is a clear refutation of such... Holy Spirit blasphemies. Um, you know, the vineyard believes that the Holy Spirit that they pray for, have faith for, believe for, expect in, is testifying to, to the doctrine of the covenanters, of Presbyterian theology, and, 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 and other sorts of things like that that have happened in Protestant history. And, you know, when, when cessationists really try to criticize charismatics, they always drill it into doctrine. Oh, their doctrine. And here's, here's Deer saying, look, the Reformation in Scotland was sound doctrine, and it was just as charismatic as the vineyard was. It was just as charismatic as the Kansas City Prophets was. Okay. So we're going to read some stuff here. The first person is George Wishart. Now, you have to understand the context here is persecution. Bloody Mary. Uh, the Catholic government of Scotland is bloodily persecuting Protestant believers in Scotland in the 1600 in the 1500s and 1600s that's the context and so many times the dreams and visions given to the pastors of these reformations of these churches of these Protestant churches in Scotland would be judgment dreams upon to punish it, their persecutors We're clearly getting a picture here, and this is starting at page 44 in Jack Deere's book, Why I Am Still Surprised by the Voice of God, that there is not just forth-telling, as is falsely taught by John MacArthur and friends, but rather foretelling of events to come in the future that are coming out of a dream 
or maybe a mental picture popping in the person's head as they pray for a person, or maybe even with their eyes open, they see something in the air. Foretelling, not just forth-telling. John Knox, the reformer, said this about George Wishart. He said that Wishart was so clearly illuminated with the spirit of prophecy that he saw not only things pertaining to himself, but also such things as some towns and the whole realm afterwards felt, which he forespoke, not in secret, but in the audience of many. He saw them, he had a spirit of prophecy, and he forespake them before they happened in front of many people. That's not forth-telling just from the Bible. That's having dreams and visions that you see. You saw things in the future, and then you declared them in public. He did that. And that brought encouragement, edification, and comfort, 1 Corinthians 14.3, to the Scottish Protestant believers that were being, at times, bloodily persecuted and tormented by the Catholic government. Um, there was a time where Pastor Wissert was preaching against Catholicism, or was, no, I'm sorry, he was preaching on the book of Romans, and a Catholic person came up to him, a Catholic government official came up to him and, um, warned him to stop preaching, and this is what he said as he was interrupted in the church service he said God is my witness that I never minded your trouble but your comfort but sure I am to reject the word of God and drive away his messengers is not the way to save you from trouble but to bring you into it when I am gone if it be long well with you I am not led by the spirit of truth and if unexpected trouble come upon you Remember, this is the cause, and turn to God by repentance, for he is merciful. In other words, that was his way of saying, I saw a dream, I saw a vision. You who are persecuting me and telling me to stop preach Romans, stop preaching the book of Romans, unfortunately, you just brought trouble upon yourself by doing this. God is going to punish you horribly for this, and this is how it will happen. Something bad will happen to you. Okay, he didn't, he didn't know exactly what it was. And he said that when the bad thing happens, know this, that I'm speaking from the spirit of truth. Um, and so Wissert, Pastor Wissert left the area. He left the area uh, to save his life. And four days later, a plague broke out on the whole town. And people were dying left and right. And uh, and out of compassion for them, he came back and ministered to them and acted like a doctor to them, you know, and helped out the nursing and, and nursed them and stuff and ministered to their spiritual needs and had complete faith that no, uh, no plague would come upon his own body. Um... So there's there's just a lot of examples like that. A lot of the you know when people had faith for a specific type of miracle, this the the type of a miracle would repeat. This is kind of the normal way Holy Spirit miracles work. Um, in different charismatic movements in history, they people after seeing a leg lengthening miracle are going to have faith to repeat leg lengthening miracles because they have faith for that. They've seen it before and they can do it again. And, and, and so in this movement, lots of the prophets prophesied in a similar fashion to Wishart because they would have faith for that type of experience because they, it was based on imitation. It was based on personal experience. It was based on memory and they would have faith for it, and the Holy Spirit would come and honor that and repeat the same type of miracle. So you wouldn't really find these people like splitting water, 
you know, because they weren't used to that. They were used to having dreams about their persecutors and, and prophesying their deaths or something. And so you would find that these experiences repeated in different men over the course of 25 or 50 years, that it, they, they, the experiences had the same characteristics. So um, different charismatic movements are like that. Like in, in Wesley's time, like the most popular experiences were either A, having a burning feeling in your belly, B, having a closed vision of Jesus dying on the cross and bleeding for your sins, or C, having a closed vision of Jesus sitting on the judgment throne. So in different charismatic movements, certain, certain spiritual experiences become homogenized and spread among the group. Um, to where because people's faith is raised for a certain specific type of experience, and then the Holy Spirit honors that faith and gives them the experience. Um, John Knox um, was persecuted by a person, and Let me let me read this because the way that they expressed it back then was a little bit hard to understand because of the old Scottish way of talking, um, and uh, so let me let me let me let me read this here. One of Knox's most famous prophecies is quoted by several of his biographers. While on his deathbed, Knox asked his friends. David Lindsay and James Lawson, to go to the Lord of Grange, William Kirkcaldy, whom Knox loved. Kirkcaldy was attempting to hold the castle of Edinburgh for Mary, Queen of Scots, against the English army. Knox said, Go, I pray you, and tell him for, from me, in the name of God, that unless he leave that evil course wherein he has entered, Neither shall that rock afford him any help, nor the carnal wisdom of that man whom he counteth half a god, William Maitland. But he shall be pulled out of that nest and brought down over the wall with shame, and his carcass shall be hung before the sun, so God hath assured me. Now he's on his deathbed as he's prophesying this. Why his bed? Probably because he dreamed it. He, he had a dream of the future of this for this man who had defected from the Protestant cause and gone over and joined the Catholic side with Mary, Queen of Scots. And he prophesied out of a dream on his deathbed that God would punish him if he wouldn't repent from siding with the Catholics against the Protestant cause. God would punish him about it. And uh, so on May 29th, which is my birthday, on May 29, 1573, Kirkledy was forced to surrender the castle, the castle that he was with Mary, Queen of Scots, Bloody Mary in. Okay. The castle gate was blocked with fallen stones due to the English bombardment. Just as, So the English army is coming upon this guy that he just prophesied about. Okay. English army is coming in, is breaking down the castle wall that he had that this man who's been on the Catholic side, right, he's in this, this castle, all right. Just as Knox had prophesied, Kirkledy was lowered over the wall by, the, by a rope in shame. On August 3rd, 1573, Kirkledy was hanged at the Murcutt Cross in Edinburgh. He was facing east, away from the sun, but before he died, his body swung around to the west so that he was, quote, hung before the sun, just as Knox had prophesied. So basically, that came to be a sign and a wonder to the Protestants on Knox's side that God was for the Protestant movement in Scotland, and he was not for Mary, Queen of Scots, and, and the Catholic side. Of course, this Protestant versus Catholic talk has continued today uh, into Ireland, and it had all sorts of negative consequences, even in violent outbursts. But um, the point is, is that ungodliness is never defensible. 
And Mary Queen, Mary Queen of Scots was an ungodly person. And the people that were involved in her Catholic government were just ungodly people. Horrible representatives. You know, just like today how we've got, you know, clergy sexual abuse going on in the Catholic Church today. It's like one of these moments in church history where there's just horrible people in places of ecclesiastical power. So that's really what we're looking about. We're looking at people judging, God judging horrible people, you know, um, and defending godly people. And using dreams and signs to encourage the church, the godly church, uh, to continue the work that they're doing. Um, Robert Bruce, who died in 1631, so he lived about a hundred years after John Knox. Um, so this movement lasted for quite a while. And um, he had angel sparkles happen to him. I mentioned him in my angel sparkle article. Robert Bruce had a healing ministry, page 55. Robert Bruce had a healing ministry in which the insane and the epileptics were completely healed. We can only wonder about the nature of the experiences that Fleming considered too supernatural to record. During this period, Fleming also mentioned angelic visitations, the audible voice of God, bright lights appearing in the darkness. Bright lights appearing in the darkness. Physical manifestations of the Holy Spirit in meetings. In other words, people jerking when they feel the Holy Spirit. In other words, Brownsville revival type stuff. And so there's there's just so many things like that. I could keep on going. Probably the the most comprehensive collection of experiences like this from the Covenanters is in Jeff Doles's book, Jeff Doles's book, uh, Miracles and Manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the History of the Church. Miracles and Manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the History of the Church by Jeff Doles. He has a much more comprehensive uh, collection of charismatic readings on that stuff. So just to, this is to give you an idea of like what's the Holy Spirit of the vineyard? What's the Holy Spirit but behind charismatic Calvinism? This is it. This is what they mean. And um, it's not the devil, John MacArthur. You're wrong. Um, we're talking about a surprising work of the Spirit of God. And although Jonathan Edwards uh, was anti-charismatic uh, in regards to visions, Jonathan Edwards was not anti-charismatic with regards to feeling the presence of God. And we're going to just stop it right there. Um, that's what charismatic Calvinists have for their point of reference. So there is real point of reference here. And cessationists are wrong because they're deists. And cessationism is a made-up word that was made in 1979 by Richard Gaffin. It's a made-up word. It's deism, it's unbelief, it's cynicism, and it's practically no different than atheism. And... I have reason to believe that cessationism is just a bunch of unbelieving rich Baptist ministry boys who are trying to, uh, or who are financially motivated to uphold their extremely rich and extremely high position ministry jobs. It's not based on the desire to know the truth of God's word with regard to the Holy Spirit. God bless you out there. This is John with WesleyGospel.com.